We come now to the first substantive topic we'll be taking through in this module, which is the large domain of language, or as I'll suggest, the even larger domain of languaging, for the word language will need to be qualified in so many ways that we may need another term altogether. Like so many of the terms that we meet in cognitive science, in its everyday sense, this is not a word that gives us problems. One could say the same for mind or thought or idea or perception. But when we try to pin things down, we find ourselves confronted with a lot of rather interesting questions and it becomes harder to identify precisely what it is that we're talking about. For this reason, the term languaging will be of some use to us. I want to begin with this quote from Max Weinreich, A Sprache ist ein Dialekt mit einer Armee in Flott. A language is a dialect with an army and a navy. The distinction he's drawing here between a language and a dialect is obviously something of a political distinction. If uh, to consider the role of English, for example, which is inextricably tied to the um, spread of the British Empire, to uh, British trading practices, colonial history and such, the original of this quote is in Yiddish, uh, a language if it is, that doesn't have an army and a navy, often um, treated as if it were somehow less than those entities we call French. But, you know, French itself is a problem. People speak in many different ways in France. There are those who would argue that there are very many languages, francophone languages in France. Um, the same is true in most countries. So this makes it clear that when we speak of a language, and we use a term like French or Chinese for that, that we are blurring over a lot of distinctions and we have introduced a lot of politics into our scientific classification. So one question immediately presents itself, which is what are we going to call language? Which things in the world, which utterances, texts, noises, engravings, images, which things that we can discuss, which concrete particulars are we going to abstract from in order to build up this category of language? Um, the confidence with which we identify language will depend greatly on whether we can point to something and say that is or that is not language. And immediately we might be brought, made aware of the distinction between speech and language. For if I if we conduct a discourse about an entity called French, we haven't made it clear whether we're talking about something which is tied to the voice or tied to the page. Um, so we've just opened up a whole can of worms, haven't we? And the question of what we mean by language will depend really on what we want that term to do for us. If we want to buy a phrase book to go on our holidays, fine, let's just get a phrase book in Bulgarian or Italian or what have you. But language has played such a central role now in cognitive science that we need to be a lot more careful. So here are two very fundamental questions that we might have when we pick up the theme of language. Um, the first one is, how should we understand this apparently systematic means of communicating that can be done with the voice or with writing indifferently? and that allows coded messages to be passed from one person to another, such that I can conceive of an idea in my, somewhere in my mind, and I can make noises or scribbles, and I give it to you, or you hear it, and now you have those ideas. What's all that about? That's a really good question. Let us shape most of the questions in linguistics. In fact, it almost has come to define the field of linguistics, and it is certainly the starting question for many of the subfields of linguistics, um, which we will be taking through in detail. But one could ask a very different question and still feel that you are trying to understand what language is. And that is something happens to our species. If we go back five or six million years, we will find the last common ancestor after which there are two branches one can follow, one leading to Homo sapiens, the other branch, which splits again, leads to chim chimpanzees and bonobos. They're our nearest neighbours from an evolutionary point of view, but language, or whatever that is, happened in that five or six million years. We're not sure when, we'll discuss that later. Um, 
But that question doesn't necessarily point to the same thing as the first question. First of all, the time scale of five or six million years makes writing irrelevant. So we're speaking about something which is necessarily vocal, which is always done in the embodied presence of others, for which there's no obvious um, political means of separating out those forms of speaking that have political power from those that don't. There's no obvious rights and wrongs. So the kind of questions that arise if we come at language in this direction um, bear little relation to the to the to what we're after when we ask the first question. So as we go along, I'll be making an argument that the first question can be used to ask questions about something that we might call language, and the second introduces the question of languaging as a much broader range of coordinative and affiliative activities that changed our species. So the history of linguistics is not terribly old. Well, certainly as a scientific discipline, language has been a fascination as long as people have been found a way to record their thoughts about the matter. Um, but the scientific study of language doesn't go much further back than the end of the 19th century. Uh, before that, there was a field called philology, which is uh, much more venerable, at least 2,000 years old. Um, but in the at the end of the 19th century, we begin to find language um, being addressed with a scientific frame of mind, and that gave rise to a hugely influential um, form of scientific activity, which is known as structuralism. Structuralism went on to affect all of the human and social sciences greatly, um, its home is in linguistics. Um, and then, at the, as a result of the major intellectual shift in the middle of the 20th century that we have begun to recognize, the cognitive turn, we find a new role for language in theories of human cognition generally. So cognitivism, with all its assumptions and computational theory of mind, come along at the same time as a very novel approach to language called generative linguistics. Um, an awareness that that way of casting language is very narrow and that in asking about language one should broaden one's concerns to include language and that's much more recent. So what was philology about before the scientists got their hands on it? Well, language has been studied for lots and lots of reasons. Um, one of the main reasons has been because there's always been specific texts I use the word in the most general sense, that have had a particular standing within various societies. And I'm thinking here primarily of religious texts, scriptures, the Bible, the Hebrew, um, Talmud and, and Torah. Um, not just in religion, though every social order seems to have particularly valued texts. Think of the role of the US Constitution, for example. Um, these needed to be interpreted by experts, and so there's always been a field of professional expertise in uh, ensuring that the texts were, in some sense, uncorrupted and that they were interpreted in appropriate fashions. Another reason is that, of course, well, most of us grow up speaking one or two, maybe three languages, and there's always lots more out there, and people aspire to learning other languages. And this often comes down to teaching something like grammar. Um, now, the habit of teaching grammar in schools has nothing to do with foreign travel, or very little to do with foreign travel, really. When we look back over a couple of hundred years, what we see is that Latin and Greek came to be to acquire a certain respected position that texts written in these particular languages have played a very important ideological role in uh, the development of Western culture. And it's here that techniques, rules, methods for teaching grammar, formalizing grammar, writing it down, saying what it is, were developed. It was much later then that we all started traveling so much. And boy, howdy, have we taken off with that. And prior to the pandemic, we used to fly everywhere. Um, so people wanted to learn foreign languages for a very different reason, not because they wanted to read Plato in the original Greek, but because they wanted to go to Barcelona and have a good time. And so this opened up a whole new area. Foreign travel began to be important in teaching languages in the 19th century. 
Um, the interpretation of specific key texts like the Bible has a broader resonance in the study of highly respected authors, people like Shakespeare and Milton, for example, in literature, and these have also had developed certain kinds of professional specializations. And all of these are perfectly fine activities. There's nothing wrong with them. They're great. It's a very scholarly activity. You need to decipher a lot of things, compare texts, interpret things. You need to know a lot of history. None of them is strictly speaking a scientific activity, and that is not meant as a denigration at all. Um, but it, towards the end of the 19th century, then, we find the first serious scientific endeavor to come to grasp with the phenomenon of language. And here, a Swiss gentleman by the name of Ferdinand de Saussure is very, very important. He's seen as the founder of both structural linguistics, which went on to influence the major scientific revolution of structuralism, and semiotics, that particular discipline which studies signs and their interpretation. De Saussure set out with a scientific frame of mind in which one observes that in which one is interested and makes clear to distinguish it from things that you're not currently interested in. One picks and chooses, one observes specific things and tries to delimit them in order to get a handle on the complexity of things. And one way that Saussure went about this was to distinguish between the everyday use of language in conversation, the words that we speak, the utterances that we produce, which as you know are often um, garbled, uh, ungrammatical, not even maybe intelligible, full of slips of thought, and so on. Um, such primary utterances don't lend themselves easily to systematization, whereas the Saussure was of the view that underlying all this behavior was an abstract system that one might characterize in its own terms. He called that long and distinguished it from parole, which is the words, the actual utterances. This is a scientific move to posit an abstract under, underlying system with structural characteristics that we might capture and formally reason about uh, is to create a scientific object. Um, so this creates the domain of linguistics as an autonomous scientific field, and it creates this new thing called language for studying. Now, of course, language was around long before that. People were languaging, people, there was all kinds of stuff going on. But the manner in which Saussure chose to define the borders of that which constituted the system constructs an object. And this linguistic object is, was seen to be systematic. And this is one reason that this became so popular. Language approached in this fashion admits of systematization. And so a new scientific goal arose that didn't exist before. How do we characterize the abstract system that underlies the messy, error-prone business of everyday talking? Now, the context in which Saussure um, created this innovation needs to be taken into account. The end of the 19th century was a wonderfully productive time in the fields of science and technology. Modern science had been around, as we've seen, since about 1600. So it wasn't that old, but and had gradually broadened its remit. It was turning to new, ever new topics. In the middle of the 19th century, of course, we have Darwin's explosion, in which humans are placed within the natural order. Um, but there's an awful lot more going on. There are changes in physics and in chemistry and biology um, that are leading to massive technological developments. And these technological developments, in turn, are changing people's lives drastically. They're changing the way people live. They're changing where they live. People are moving to cities. They're working in factories. We have the whole Industrial Revolution. Um, so science seems to be paying off. And every time the scientific mind gets turns its attention to new fields, there seems to be some kind of payoff. Now, it's worth in this context comparing these two tables because they show you something of the flavor of science at this time, at the end of the 19th century. At the bottom is something you're quite familiar with, the periodic table of the elements, first put together in 1871 by Mendeleev. And this represents a means of systematizing the knowledge 
that existed about a whole bunch of substances, elements as we now call them. These elements, each of them has different properties and the properties are related to each other in complex ways. And Mendeleev's genius lay in founding a way of systematizing this organization, um, arranging the rows and columns of the periodic table based on known properties of each element, made clear relationships, family relationships among them, made clear distinctions among them, and served to organize the whole domain of chemistry. Now, if you take that mindset, you can apply that to lots of things. What you do is you go in, you find some, some complex domain, and you try to identify individual elements in a broader sense, which are interestingly and systematically related to one another. And this was done then at the end of the 19th century for the domain of the sounds of speech. And the top graph shows another table, and it's another attempt to, to use a table form of organization to, to illustrate systematic relationships among a bunch of elements. The elements shown here are the set, as was thought, of all consonantal contrasts that can be drawn in all languages at all times, as it were. We won't go into it in great detail, but from left to right we see a change in where the consonant is articulated within the mouth, starting at the lips and going all the way back to the throat. And from top to bottom we see a change in the manner in which the sound is, is generated. So we distinguish between stops or plosives such as p and b, where we actually stop the airflow, or fricatives, where we merely introduce turbulence like f, v, s, sh. Um, sometimes these are elements are organized in pairs, for very many sounds come in pairs where one is voiced like v, and one is voiceless like f. One is voiced like s, sorry, Z and voiceless like s. Um, this contrast occurs again and again, and that allowed um, linguists at the time to suspect that underlying the sounds in any given language were a set of formal contrasts, abstract contrasts, that this could be stated in universal terms. So the goal of the International Phonetic Alphabet was to capture the sounds of all languages, and that would be systematic. So that gives you a flavor for the thinking of the time. And this form of systematic organization came to characterize structuralism generally, and was that mindset was then developed further and applied to things like, for example, kinship systems in an anthropological context, or to the psyche in, psych in, in uh, certain forms of psychoanalysis. So it's a general way of ordering things that allows you to discipline a wild and untamed domain. The emphasis here was not on explanation, but on description, on capturing those contrasts that would allow you to describe languages and to distinguish languages. And the notion of language here we're using is the familiar one, which goes along with terms like French and German. Um, the study of language is never far from political concerns. One could say the same about everything in cognitive science. But it became clear to the dominant world power, the America in the Second World War, that they had, in order to extend the power of the American Empire further, they needed to systematize and improve their teaching of foreign languages. Um, and there had been enough work done in structural linguistics to believe that this was possible. And so this is the origin of many of the departments of linguistics in the United States of America, particularly they sprang up after the Second World War with the intention of finding the means that would unlock those pesky foreign means of communication. Thanks.